everyone, and welcome to No BS Baking. You got JP here, and today we're going to continue to look at key calculations and how they can assist you in optimizing recipes and process. Professional bakers use these as an important part of bake planning for good reason. So let's get into it. Have you ever walked into your grocer to buy flour and you see all sorts of different brands of AP or bread flour sitting on the shelf and wonder, is this high protein quality flour or a middle of the road bargain brand? Some companies display their protein content loud and proud on their packaging, while others do not. So what is the protein of this flour? And how much of it is the good stuff that gives my bread a strong rise? To figure out the total protein of the flour, we first have to look at the nutritional label. We locate the serving size and the protein listed, which are the most commonly listed in grams. Then, using our simple ratio and proportion grid we looked at in part one, we lay out our headings and perform the simple math. This flour has a declared total protein of 13.8, which for bakers represents a strong bread flour. And for those folks that are new to the channel and may not understand when I say 13.8 is a strong bread flour, then get the baking assistant. For everything you need to know about flour protein, protein versus rice potential, protein versus hydration, W index, and more. So a flour with 13.8% protein is a good strong flour for baking, right? <laughs> Mostly yes, but sometimes no. When it comes to modern white wheat flours, the protein percentage is a key indicator of baking performance. High protein flours tend to perform well, especially for breads requiring a significant rise. Conversely, low protein flours are typically not used for these types of purposes. Now, even with the best flours, not all protein is gluten forming. Here is a quick visual for reference on gas retention potential based on these percentages of protein being gluten forming. The key takeaway is that 13.8% protein flour basically contains about 10 to 12% gluten forming protein, and that depends on the species, the growing conditions, and the milling process used. When it comes to ancient wheats, you may note that the package declaration states a high protein content. Now, this is where it can often get a little tricky. Not only do these types of wheats generally have a lower percent of gluten protein, but the quality of the gluten or the balance of the two main gluten proteins may dramatically influence mix time tolerance and rise potential. So it's very important to do a little research and make some adjustments when using these flours. Eggs are a lovely addition to baked goods. However, they contain a lot of water, which in many recipes is often not factored correctly. They use large eggs, you only have medium, now what? Now this may seem a little nitpicky, but one small change like this and the recipe may be too stiff or too slack based on your flour and the accuracy of the hydration plan to begin with. Okay, so let's start by looking at the makeup of an egg. Depending on who you ask or where you look, the general guidelines are about like this. Of the total weight of an egg, the shell is around 10%, yolk around 30%, and whites about 60%. Here, I used the baking assistant calculators to deduct the weight of the shell and provide a total amount of water and solids, as you can see. Now, if you're calculating manually, then you should make note of that yolks are 50% water and 50% solids, whereas whites are about 90% water and 10% solids, to keep it simple. Okay, so now let's do the math. Now in this instance, we'll use the full weight of the egg with a shell, and that's 57 grams. We know that 30% of the total weight is yolk, and 60% is whites. So here you can see the simple math, and here is the result. Now that we know the weights, let's calculate the water in solids. Yolk is 50% water and 50% solids, so 17.1 divided by 2 equals 8.56. Now, I left everything as a calculation using ratio and proportion, more so for you to become accustomed to using it. However, if you're keen on math, 
calculate it as you like. Now next I took the egg whites, which was 34.2 grams, and I want to determine the water in the solids. So I used 90% and 10% respectively, and here is the result. Now I just add this all up, and I can confirm that 39 grams of water and 12 grams of solids from this one large egg. So now that we've worked through the full math sequence, let's look at a quick way to do a fast approximation and skip a bunch of steps. So you crack the egg, threw it in a bowl, and weighed it. Let's assume the 10% of the weight of the shell held true, and the egg in the bowl on the scale weighs 51 grams or thereabouts. Now you just take your actual weight of the egg and multiply it by 74% for a close approximation of the water, and 26% to determine the solids, or, you know, the difference between the water and the original weight of the egg in the bowl. I mean, you get what I mean. So well, as I stated, eggs contribute a lot of water to the dough. So as an example, if you have a recipe requiring 500 grams of flour and you want a 65% hydration for this dough, then you need to subtract the water from the eggs from the water plant in the dough. You don't want to see your dough increase to 80%. This could be problematic by just adding these two eggs. Now, here I cut the water by 15% and adjusted my required water to 250 mils or grams to compensate. If you have any questions or you need a bit of clarification on any of this, do not hesitate or to leave a comment in the comment section or email me direct. I am here to help. Bakers often find from time to time that yeast levels may need to be adjusted. You know, cold snap is hit and the house is cooler than normal, or that summer heat is really just getting that yeast going just a bit too quickly. Now, as I've discussed in numerous videos, yeast levels in bread recipes are generally set to deliver around a one-hour double in size rest time and a one-hour final proof in a slightly warmer environment. So, if you want to make a quick adjustment to speed up the fermentation process or slow it down, then here is another excellent way to achieve this using indirect ratio and proportion. If it's a temperature-related issue, such as summer and winter baking, then ratio and proportion can be used to help sort this out. This requires a calculation using indirect proportion, which is how I like to demonstrate it with all the math starting from the top of the cross grid, not the bottom, like direct proportion. So here I put my usual kitchen temperature and the yeast I generally use for the recipe. However, now the temperature has dropped in my kitchen to 68 degrees Fahrenheit and I want to know what I should change my yeast to be. Here you can see the math, which flows from the top to the bottom. Likewise, I created another example where it's not so much about a difference in temperature I'm worrying about, but I want to tighten up my times to more of around the 60 minute mark versus the 80 minutes it's currently taking to proof. A little bit of math, some different heading measurements, and we'll uh, have my answer. Now, sometimes when using ratio and proportion, I even get my direct and indirect math mixed up. However, it's quick to identify, as in these examples. If I use the direct method and started from the bottom of the grid, then you can see the result is less yeast. And we know that that makes no sense. So I can quickly determine that this is actually an indirect calculation where the results show more logical answer as previously noted. So you can do many different calculations using both direct and indirect proportion. Just keep things organized and appropriate for each heading. Apples with apples, oranges with oranges. There are many wonderful flavor and enrichment powders and flowers you can add into bread and roll products. However, building them in for many is a guessing game with respect to how much water you need to add to keep the recipe balanced. An unbalanced recipe can lead to premature staling, a dry, crumbly, and maybe a bit gritty crumb texture, or a soft, sloppy dough that performs poorly or is difficult to work with through further processing. 
Much of this has to do with absorption rates and capacities. Some ingredients are thirstier, requiring more water, while others may hydrate slower than flour, leaving too much free water available in the dough during processing. Likewise, some ingredients can absorb water quickly, resulting in the flour being underhydrated. This results in a dry, crumbly texture and a weak gluten network, resulting in a dough that is less elastic and stretchy. Additionally, underhydrated doughs affect the activity of yeast, resulting in often poor rise and a flat, dense product. When it comes to flour, most are medium capacity flour, similar to modern white flour. Therefore, most of these can be factored into the standard hydration plan. Now, as an example, if I was replacing 20% of my white flour with one of these, I wouldn't really veer too much from my planned hydration. If it was 65%, then I would treat all the flour as wheat flour and use 65% for my start control dough. Obviously, some flours listed here may require a little more water than bread flour or even a little less. But for starting off, I would stick with my base hydration plan and then fine tune on the next go. Now, powders can be thirsty and can vary widely in both hydration capacity and rates at which they take up water. Now, here I listed a few common powders and their hydration capacities. Now, keep in mind that hydration capacity is not about reconstituting, say, an egg powder to its liquidy form. It's about getting the powder to a point where it's fully saturated so it doesn't try and equalize by stealing water from the finished dough or bread. This is one of the key reasons why some breads may dry out or stale prematurely. Because depending the hydration rate of the ingredient, it could continue to draw water during the cooling stage and beyond. So with powders, I would always soak them in advance. If I didn't know the actual hydration capacity, I would keep things simple and go with a 1 to 1 ratio. Or if I used 20 grams of powder, then I would add 20 mils or grams of water. Now even if I knew the capacity, I would start with 80% on the first time. So in this example, we know that the capacity, which is about 150%, but I never used this powder before like this. So to play it safe, I'm going to use 80% of the hydration capacity for my first go around. If it looks good and appeared that I can put a bit more water in it the next time, then I'll bump it up. So anyway, I wanted to be thorough and go through the math. However, as I stated, the quick, more loose method is one-to-one. -one. Now, I hope these calculations help, uh, and there'll be a few more which I will share with you. However, if you want to bake with precision but don't want to think about the math, then get the Baking Assistant for 12 quick automated calculators for all your baking needs. Check out the store for full details.